joining us in worship today. Welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church. We are part of the United Church of Christ, which is a denomination that is raising their voice as an alternative vision of what church can be, where God is seen as all loving and inclusive. In a time when many find the church narrow and out of touch, we preach a progressive gospel. Here, barriers of ethnicity, class, and sexual orientation are torn down. Here, everyone is welcome. So if you believe in God some of the time, none of the time, or all of the time, you are welcome here to renew your mind and your spirit. Because whoever you are, wherever you are on your faith journey, we welcome you. Straight, gay, PhD, GED, no D's at all. We welcome you here to experience God in this community. So, I want everybody to take a deep breath. Ah, let us settle in. And before we get started, we have a real treat today. Reverend Gonzalez, who is our Illinois Conference Minister, is here in worship with us this morning to bring us greetings. Buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and the blessing of allowing me to be in your midst. I also want to thank you because I do believe that as a society and people, we don't say thank you enough. So I want to thank you for being the faithful expression of the United Church of Christ within your community. I want to thank you for opening the doors wide and open and allowing anyone, everyone, who needs a touch, who needs compassion, who needs their worth and their dignity uplifted to find a home and a sacred place where they can simply be who God has created them to be and find the community that wraps around them in love and compassion. One of the things I've learned in life is I don't need to understand everything. I just need to love. So I thank you for allowing us, allowing me to be here. I thank you for being part of this conference. I thank you for your support of our ch church-wide admission to OCWM. And I thank you for being you. I hope to get to know you a little bit better. I heard that there's some secret things going to happen at lunchtime or fellowship time. So we'll enjoy those too. But I really would like to get to know you. Blessings to you this morning.
parable of the Good Samaritan, in case you hadn't caught that message from Maureen, of the pineapples and the oranges and the apples. And it is from the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 10, beginning on verse 25. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the man asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when, when he came to the place and saw the man, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three? do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the man said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
is fixed, my mind's made up, I want to be used. I think that that's almost a verbatim translation of what Reverend Dr. Stephen Ray said to the search committee when we called him to be the president of Chicago Theological Seminary. Because all that he had done before then prepared him for that moment. And we were wise enough to actually see it. To actually see it. 13th president? 13th president of Chicago Theological Seminary. We are grateful to have uh, Dr. Ray with us this morning. Prior to coming to CTS, he was a professor of systematic theology at Garrity Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary in Evanston. He's done a variety of things, a lot of things, and you can read about it in your bulletin. Um, I want to emphasize that his current work focuses on the church's complicity in genocides, which have unfolded during modernity, and in theologically reconstructing the idea of Christian vocation so that it no longer contributes to the formation of genocide, but actually contributes to the formation of Christians who actively resist gen genocide. He is the author of several books, A Struggle from the Start, The Black Community of Hartford, 1639 to 1960. Just so that you know, he has really credible congregational New England roots. And Do No Harm, Social Sin and Christian Responsibility. We are very welcoming uh, of Stephen this morning in our pulpit, and we are also welcoming to his wife, Susan Ray. They have been married for over 30 years, which is an amazing thing, which is an amazing thing. And they have a wonderful daughter, Kiara. Well, I have to be honest with you, I am so pleased and happy to be here with you this morning. I was honored to receive the invitation from Reverend Hughes. I'm honored to be in the church where two of my most supportive and helpful trustees have roots and are part of Susan and Janet McClain. And I got a special treat this morning when I saw Reverend Benny White. Back in 1991, up in the mountains of New Hampshire, there was a retreat for UCC seminarians. And he was one of the people who inspired me and encouraged me. So it fills my heart with joy to see you this morning. Indeed, it is a gift from God. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I also am very happy to see that I'm amongst my own people. Now, you know, I see, I saw the uh, language of uh, pilgrim and congregational, so I'm a John the Will congregation was born and raised, but I didn't know if you were my people until I looked at the back of the sanctuary and I saw the clock. I said, these are my people. <laughs> so indeed, it is good to be in your midst. Now this morning, I want to take a bit of a journey with you. So it's Seminary Sunday, but my feeling is that if a seminary president only comes to talk to you about why theological education is good, then they're just on a fundraising tour. I'm here to talk to you about why we need theological education, and so my sermon is going to focus on why it is that we need people who can take our faith into the public square. Now this morning I want to journey with you down a road which many of you have been before. It is a road that is perhaps most, the most famous road in the Western imagination. There is no road that is more famous in the imagination of the West than the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. Even people who've never been there, seen any pictures of it, have been shaped by stories about it. For the sheer invocation of its name takes the listener to a text, the one that we just heard, that is perhaps the most important text in all of Christian pedagogy, all of Christian teaching, the text to treat your neighbor well. Now I'd like to invite you down the road which Jesus used as the setting for this uh, parable in narrative form uh, to outline and describe 
for his listeners what was the content of our responsibility to our neighbor. Now given that Jesus was a practitioner of the faith, which saw our one's relationship to God as being mediated by your relationship to your neighbor, this becomes really the center of our faith. So when he asked, what is the greatest commandment? It is to love thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy spirit, and with all of thy strength. Forgive me, I'm like King James. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So this morning I'd like to invite you down this well-worn road to help us with another question. And it's the question that I believe to be the most pressing one facing people of faith here in our nation today, and that is what is the responsibility do we, as people of faith, have to our society? Which is, in the final analysis, the basis of our relationship to our neighbor, because we can't treat our neighbor well if our society is ill. We can't be related to one another in fitful ways if our society is not functioning. What is our responsibility as people of faith to this public square that we call our home? Now entertain in your mind, if you would, that our society, our policy, our place might be personified. That we can actually think about it in terms of an image. Now I look around the congregation and there are any number of you who remember the personification of our nation and its government as Uncle Sam. Right, that was the evocation, the personification of our government and its responsibility to us. So I would like to draw, uh, I would like to suggest to you that were we to personify our society right now, as we speak, in 2019, it would be much like the man that's battered and bruised on the side of the road. For like that man, our society has fallen among thieves who have beaten and robbed us of perhaps our most important possession. That is the dream that we might have a better society together. The dream that we might be a society whose future might be better than our past. The dream that our greatness is in the future and not in the distant past. The dream that our past of slavery, genocide against indigenous peoples, ethnic cleansing, which created a mountain of despair, there was a dream that we might carve a pathway of hope. But the thieves have done their work well. Our society has been bruised by the malice and the resentment and the hatred and the xenophobia, and it has left this dream of who we can be by the side of the road. The bruises are visible in the faces of children separated from their parents at the border and living in near concentration camp conditions. The wounds are visible in the near daily torrent of xenophobia and anti-black and anti-brown animus which permeates our awareness, our airwaves, and the social media. If I see one more story about a barbecue bag and sidewalk Sandy or someone else who has brought this hatred into the public square, I think I'm going to scream. The hurt is made palpable by the base and guttural public discourse which emanates from on high and has become the lingua franca of this fetid sewer into which we have been dragged as a nation. So our nation is like the man who was beaten and robbed on the side of the road. The dream of who and what we can be, the hope that we might indeed be able to one with another build a future in which there is room for all of us lays now by the side of the road, needing help and needing resuscitation. But, 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 bloody and bruised though it may be, our society and the dream of it as a place with room for us all 
is not yet down for the count. But if this dream of what our society can be, if this nation is to be more than the sum of its wounds and its grievances, someone has got to care enough to bind up the wounds which have us wash in tears. If our nation is going to live into the promise of what we can be together, someone has got to care enough about the demonization of our neighbors to wipe away the graffiti that has been written on their bodies and from the walls of our society. If we are to give our children a future that is worth having, someone has got to care enough about it. Otherwise, we will not have it. Somebody's got to care more than the priest whose only concern was piety and church vitality. You know, there's something kind of heretical. When you're in the midst of a society when evil sits on high and the powers and principalities seem as if they stride across the nation stage as if they own the future, present, and past for people to be concerned about church vitality. Maybe if you were concerned about doing God's work, in the world, the Spirit would give you the vitality to do that work. Somebody has got to care more than the Levite, whose concern for orthodoxy and probity leaves him ever willing to keep closet doors closed and more importantly make new ones where none existed before. Someone has got to care more than the religious folk who forget that religion exists in the world for the benefit of God's children who are here. It doesn't exist simply for us to feel good. It doesn't exist simply for us to have some place to go on Sunday morning. It doesn't exist simply for us to go someplace and find a donor with our coffee. <laughs> Religion exists in the world so that the ways of the world, ways which finally demand that the most powerful have everything and that the weakest always want, does not have the final word. We need somebody, some Samaritan, who's willing to step away from their own way to tend to the wounds of our society. We need somebody, some Samaritan, who is willing to step away from their own grievance, their own hurt and pain, to lift up our society that is battered and torn, and to begin the journey of healing. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, during Black History Month, if you study Black History, there's a lot that I have to be angry about. There's a lot that I have to have a grievance about. There's a lot that I have to have, both in terms of my own personal story, the story of my family, my lynched great-grandfather. I have a lot to be angry about, but I have to set that aside because the future that God is calling us to build together is so much more than simply the little grievances that I have. And this is the reason why I can say that simply wallowing in resentment is no way to build the future. The only thing it does is make you a prisoner of the past. We, our children, our nation, and our world need somebody to care enough about our future to help our society today. Somebody needs to care enough about tomorrow so that we can once again join hands and go down that pathway of hope. Somebody needs to care enough to want their neighbor to be with them. And Jesus closed his tale, his parabolic answer to the question about the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment to love thy God with all of thy heart, all of thy spirit, all of thy strength, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. He closed the tale around this commandment with the counsel to be as the Samaritan, a good neighbor. And I close my sermon with the simple words of Scripture.
for you to go and do likewise. Amen. He gave me my hands to reach out to man to show him your love and your perfect plan. You gave I can hear the cries of sinners, but cannot wipe away their tears. You gave me my voice to speak your word, to sing all your praises to those who never I see hearts that have been broken, so many people to be free. Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say do use me Lord to show experience this day. As you go about your week, remember our mandate to love one another, to be like the Good Samaritan. May the love of God surround you, the peace of God dwell in you, and the justice of God compel you. Go in peace and amen. Amen.